Alexander Show is proud to be celebrating the induction of Janet Jackson into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by speaking to people in the industry who have great insight into Janet's career and why it's so important that Janet gets the recognition she deserves from the Rock Hall. We're very happy to welcome back to the show someone who knows Janet very well and who was a huge part of her success in the 80s and 90s, award-winning choreographer Tina Landon. Tina, welcome back to the Kelly Alexander Show. What, what? Here I am. (laughs) Thank you so much for doing this. You always answer uh, the call when I when I harass you to come back on the show. So thank you for doing this again. Absolutely. First of all, my first question, we're going to take you back in time a little bit, which I know you love because I know when you uh, I, you love when I harass your memory. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you're better than Sudoku or um, crossword puzzles. Exactly. You make my brain work so hard. I'm, like, I'm going to be young forever. <laughs> That's awesome. So the first question, though, I did want to ask you, um, where were you when you got the news that your good friend Janet uh, was announced as one of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's class of 2019? And what immediately sprang to mind when you when you got the news that she's going in? Where was I? I don't know. I think I was, yeah, I think I was just chilling on my couch. And it's, you know, it was one of those things where half of your brain goes, well, it's about time. And then the other half goes, wait, why did it take so long? Like, what? Why is this just now happening? Or is this old news? Like, literally, I was a little confused. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And so, um, so obviously very excited for her, I have no doubt. And then uh, I wanted to take you back a little bit just to, I guess, the first time you actually met Janet. Can you remind uh, the listeners when that was and what your first thoughts of her were? Ooh, you're asking me to go way back. Way back into the 80s. Uh, When was the first time... I think just because I knew people who knew her, but I don't think I met Janet until um, the What Have You Done For Me Lately video. Okay. I think that was the first time. And yeah, I happened to be in town. I was supposed to be doing a Puma Industrial and it got canceled. And, you know, especially at that time, that was like one of my first dance job, my big dance jobs. And I was mortified. And Paula called me, Paula Abdul, because I know you're supposed to be out of town for another gig, but this came up. And I'm like, what? Janet Jackson? Yeah, I'll do it. It was like one of the first things I never had to audition for. I got called to do it. And it was like, it, it, you know, as a dancer, you're like, wow, this is like, I'm making it now. Like, this is it. This is something's happening. And yeah. And then I got called in to do that video. And that was the first time I think I actually met her. Okay. So on the set of what have you done for me lately? It, well, yeah. In rehearsal. Okay. In rehearsal. Right. And so talk to us about, I guess, um, your first impressions of her in rehearsal for that video, for that song. Uh, you know, she was so quiet, completely quiet and, and reserved. Um, and as a dancer, you're always, you know, when somebody comes in, when the artist comes in, a star comes in, it always disrupts the flow of rehearsal, no matter what. So it's like you might be learning stuff and being cool, and then all of a sudden you're like over, you're, you're over the top, and you're trying too hard, and everyone's giggly and, and acting stupid in the room. It happens every single time. So I kind of remember a little bit of that. Like everybody was a little giddy and giggly, and, you know, Janet wasn't, she didn't have the, the notoriety at that time. I mean, at that time, yes, she was a star. Yes, she was from the Jackson clan. Yes, she was Michael's sister and she was Penny and she was all that. So it was this, um, a new, it was like this new rising star feeling in the room, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's amazing. And now uh, you danced with her on that song and then you, you came back too for When I Think of You, right? I did. Yes. Okay. And Paula made me audition for that. Oh, did yes, she? I remember. Oh. <laughs> yes. She, yes. She made me audition for that. Whatever. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. That's so that, and that was, and that was a huge video. I mean, there was tons of people in that. In fact, I remember, I think, I don't know where the interview or which interview it was that Janet did, but she talks about the first time she met me and she was scared of me. Cause if you look at me in the, what have you done for me lately video, I have this, this was my Prince and Wendy days. So I had, I was look, trying to look like Wendy from Prince. And I <laughs> had one side of my hair shaved with blonde hair. And I was actually very lucky that Paula picked me for that. Cause you know, that was pretty crazy hairstyle even for that time. Okay. Oh um, my God. <laughs> but yeah, so sorry. So heading back to that, that was my first kind of um, 
introduction to Janet and Janet to me. And then when we did the um, when I think of you video, that was that was just like a whole new level of it was a bigger set. It was a bigger production. It was I think we had 30 dancers or 20 dancers. So it felt kind of like a stage production. It was it was it was fun. It was it was a very um, kind of when you think of old Hollywood, like that's what it felt like for in the video world. It felt like an old Hollywood stage performance. Yeah, it was amazing. And it was like a lot of one shot, right? Like following her sort of through the street and all that stuff. So it was epic. Yeah, we. I think we I know the, the intention was to do it in one continuous shot. I think they may have had to do two. Um, because this thing that she jumped down from or did a bat flip from or something like that, I think that had to be edited. But, you know, back then that was like, what? Nobody did that. So it was choreographed from beginning to end. And, you know, everyone's scuffling around stage to get to the next section of the floor. Like, you know, normally you're just in one set and you're on and off, kind of on and off the stage when you're doing like a a musical or a production. But this was kind of in a round circle. So we would do one section and then run through the set and like peel off a jacket or have a different look and then end up on a different part of the set while Janet's still moving through, you know, doing the verse, doing the chorus. Yeah, it was a very uh, intricate, intricate way to shoot, I think. For sure. And it's funny, as you were talking, I do remember the interview that Janet was talking about you. I almost want to th- say it was in the Runaway a documentary, but she said something like, yeah, like, Tina's so I tough. I think so. Yeah, she's like, Tina's so yeah. tough. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. That's great. You intimidated Janet right off the top. <laughs> That's the way to win an artist. Yeah. You scare the crap out of them. They'll hire you back every time. Oh my god! Now during those two, so those two, um, those two shoots or whatever, you didn't really become buddies with her then, though, right? It was really when Rhythm Nation came around, right? Because um, right, our, our circles kept intertwining because you know Renee and Terry Bixler, who were both in, oh, that was a nasty video, sorry, but Terry Bixler, Anthony Thomas, Renee, and another guy named Jazzy were all in. Um, LA City Rockers. So they were in their pop and walking group. And they had been to the house. They knew Michael. They met Janet. Uh, this was before Renee and Janet got together. They were just buddies. And Paula knew them also. It was all intertwined. So it was like, I knew all these people that knew Janet, but we didn't really hang out at all. Um, I actually, I remember giving Janet a ride home Rehearsal. I have no idea why she didn't have a car or a ride that day, but I gave her a ride in my 76, I think, Camaro that looked like Starsky and Hutch. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> and it, yeah, because I had taken it to a friend to do body work. So not only was it red with white racing stripes, it had gray primer and red primer all over the car. And I'm pulling into the Jackson like mansion going, uh, you're, you're home. I'll just leave you right here if you can walk to the door. And I think she may have even been sitting on one of the dancers' laps. I don't know. It was crazy. But um, we were intertwined, but not really friends. And then I think when our friendship really took off was when uh, we did the Rhythm Nation project together. So I wanted to ask you about that. So, um, but you had to audition for that too, right? You didn't just get it. I did not just get it. I had to audition for that. Um, and at that time, uh, there was some behind the scenes turmoil, not with Janet and myself, but with some of the other players that I just mentioned earlier, an ex-boyfriend of mine, blah, 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 blah. I was not going to go to the audition because I thought that I wasn't going to get a fair shot because nobody liked my ex-boyfriend at the time. Right. Okay. And I was connected to him. And I thought they're not going to give me a free shot or a fair shot. I'm not even going to come. And it was actually Terry Bixley, Bixler who said, no, you have to come. Are you crazy? And I said, no, I just don't think I should go. And he said, well, you're coming. You're ridiculous. You're coming. That's Terry Bixler. And he was my buddy. And he's actually the reason that I ended up where I did, because if it wasn't for him, I don't know that I would have gone to the audition in the first place. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, especially because of all the history now that you have with Janet. It's crazy that that could have almost not happened, you know? I know, right? Crazy. (laughs) Now, um, let's talk a little bit about Rhythm Nation, the project. I wanted to ask you what it was like, because by then, you know, Janet um, had control under her belt, uh, and which obviously Mm -hmm. was extremely successful. And then now that she was kind of in her sophomore effort, if you will, even though I know this was, you know, her fourth album. Um, But I wanted to know what it was like to kind of 
watch her create and grow with the juggernaut that was Rhythm Nation because there were so many facets to it. There was, of course... um, just the, the song and the album itself, or the songs, I should say, uh, they were socially conscious. They were things that people didn't really equate with uh, dance music or pop music where she's talking about you know homelessness and all this sort of stuff and, and, and racism, which you wouldn't sort of necessarily find in a pop song. Uh, on top of that, there right. was the long form videos. And then this was going to be her first world tour ever. So being in that, uh, what was it like to watch her kind of go through that, especially because she was only like 23, 24 at the time? Uh, you know, for me at that time, I was still so green about the industry, about Los Angeles. You know, I grew up an hour outside of Los Angeles where there's nothing but desert that separates you. So it is a different world. I mean, I may as well have been in New York. That's how small my town was. Um, so for me, it was everything literally was it was like Dorothy stepping on the yellow brick road and the whole thing coming to life and glittering. Like that's what every day felt like for me because it was all new and I I had nothing to compare it against because I was already at such a high level without really understanding it completely. So I could understand that I could understand at that time that it was a high level, that it was class and that it was new and that it was different. And at the same time, you're kind of just in awe that you get to be a part of all of this. So it's really weird to have any kind of real understanding when you're kind of in the middle of it all. And I just felt, you know, it's like fear in the eye of a hurricane, not, and, or, or yeah. And, and not, I mean, a hurricane's not a good thing, but I'm just saying the, the velocity of everything that's surrounding you and happening around you, but you're, you're in this calm center. Right. And that, and, you know, and Jen has all, always had it. She, her, persona and her personality is just always a calm center, no matter what's happening around her. So it's like you're in this with her and it was really hard to get a full picture until you either seen the video or seen the tour or been away from it all for a while. And then you look, look back and go, Oh my God, that just happened. Like, but when you're in it, you're just showing up for work every day going, wow, isn't this cool? This right. is a fun project to be a part of. And when you're a dancer who loves what you're doing, there's just nothing better. There just really isn't. It's the icing on the cake. It's the cream on your pasta. It's like, yeah, this is this is my life. I love how this choreography sits in my body, even though it was very strange. I was used to Anthony because I was part of the LA City Rockers for a very small stint. Um, so I got the style, and and it was it was for me because I've always loved. Uh, classic dance and I've always loved jazz and tap and ballet, but I've always had this this love for anything that was street, anything that was different, anything that was raw, um, because I didn't come from that. So anytime I had a chance to blend the two or be of a part of, you know, a choreographer who blended the two and I got to be a part of that, that was just magic for me. So yeah, if I had to pick one word, I'd say magic. Okay. Joining us on the Kelly Alexander Show, award-winning choreographer Tina Landon. Make sure you follow her on Twitter and Instagram at I am Tina Landon. And Tina's going to post more Instagram pictures in 2019. <laughs> We're going to make sure she does that. Um, I have to bring up uh, Design of a Decade. This often doesn't get talked about Design of a Decade, but that album came out in October of 95. And it was a compilation of her massive songs from that past decade, so 86 to 96. Uh, but it also contained two mm-hmm. songs, uh, two new songs at the time, Runaway and 24 Play. And Runaway became its own hit. Uh, you were obviously a huge part of that, uh, the choreography and the video. And we're going to talk about that in just a sec. But I did want to ask you, because I know, obviously, at that particular time, you and Janet, super tight. Um, what was Janet's mind frame, if you, if you know this, I'm not sure, but if, uh, her mind frame in releasing a best of? Because I can only imagine, if I was sitting in Janet's shoes, you know, putting together this best of compilation and you're kind of now seeing your life in song from 10 years, uh, you know, Miss You Much and Rhythm Nation and like, uh, you know, That's the Way Love Goes, like all these songs that you've put out. Um, what what was she feeling or do you know what she was feeling when she was compiling that album and, and deciding that this was going to, you know, be something for the fans and put this out, this 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 retrospective of the last 10 years of her life? Uh, I mean, I don't know what she was thinking or feeling necessarily but what i do know is that uh janet's connection with her fans is really like no other i mean she really really gets them and i think they get her so my guess is that 
you know, she probably, I mean, this is kind of how we would do set lists for the show. We kind of put down all of our favorite things and things that she, I mean, she knew obviously which ones were number one, which ones got radio play, which one, like she's really good at keeping all those numbers and things in her head. Um, so I think for her, it was, okay, let me, let me list everything that could possibly go into this. And then now let's weed it out. I know this was a fan favorite. I know this was a number one hit. I know this was, you know what I mean? So then you just start weeding them out. And I'm sure it was, that was a double album. Wasn't that uh, a double CD? Maybe. I know there was a fair amount of songs on it. I'm trying to remember. Cause I feel like I had it on vinyl. So I'm trying to remember. Yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of songs going on. Still love the vinyl tea. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, that's awesome. It's back again, by the way. Yeah. Thank God. Um, <laughs> But I guess my point is that if it was a double, or see, I mean, it could have been quadruple. It could have been, you know, it, it, she had so many hits. She had so many favorites. And and as we know, sometimes the favorites aren't the number ones and vice versa. But I, I just think she, she has a real innate, innate um, ability to weed through that stuff, to see it very clearly. So I, I don't know. I, I think the only struggle would have been like, if, they, if there was only X amount of songs that could fit on this album it, with her struggling of, uh, if, if there's only 20, but I have 22, which one do I cut out? You know, that kind of thing. Okay. And I did want to ask you, because I don't think you and I have actually ever really talked about this before, but Runaway, like I said, it could have just been a filler song in a way. Not that I think Janet would have ever done that, but there was obviously a lot of effort mm-hmm. put into that song. And then, of course, like you and I have talked about this before, sort of off air, um, just that behind the scenes footage that we saw of you guys on set for that video because it was so prolific and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what's your favorite thoughts about Runaway and, and being on set for that? Like, do you like I feel like Runaway is a, definitely a fan favorite. And I think it sits very um, like it just sits in such a good place in, in, in fans hearts. Well, you know, it's a feel good song. It just it. It was one of my favorite to do when we were on tour because no matter what, it's like you could be having a bad day, you could be in a bad mood, but you can't listen to that song and stay in that bad place. Like it just makes you feel good. And I remember uh, when she called me because I, I, the first thing I kept thinking, I was like, I don't know why my body keeps going to a Hawaiian movement. I just want to do like it just felt that way. It was the drums. It was whatever. She wanted me to collaborate with Masai who went by a different name. I don't know what name he's going by these, these days, but um, that's who he and I got in the studio and, and he was, was more African based. And I thought, Oh my God, these movements kind of go well together. Like we started playing around with that. He started doing this, like that weird snatchy thing. So it's like, we're snatching flies and we kind of laughed about it. And then I added the hits from Hawaii. I'm like, Oh my God, this is weird. I don't know. Is this weird? But it felt right. It was, it was a very bizarre thing to choreograph because it was very different than anything else that she had done. Um, and yet when we were in the studio, we just kept listening to the music. That's what just felt natural. And that's what I've learned over my lifespan as a choreographer. It's like, sometimes I'm fighting my body. If I'm trying to do something the artist has asked for specifically and it doesn't work. And then I just have to go with like, this is what my body wants to do on that drum beat. This is what my body wants to do on that vocal. And it usually all, all comes together. So when I, when we presented it, I thought, I don't know if she's going to like this at all. And I didn't, I still don't remember now what her reaction was. Obviously she liked it because we kept it. Um, and it, she looked beautiful doing it. So it was really fun to do something that was completely different than what anyone had seen her do. And it wasn't for the sake of being different. It was just for the sake of this is what works for this song. Okay, perfect. And with such a, um, yeah, it was just such a flowy, beautiful, energetic song. Like, it was just amazing. And being on set, I know it was rip-roaring hot, right, for you guys? Oh, my God, yeah. We were in the valley. I just remember being in our trailer. Like, it was, you were either hot outside or hot in the trailer. It didn't matter, but it was, yeah, it was blazing. Wow. Okay. Well, you guys pulled it off. That's for sure. Um, (laughs) Now I'm going to push you forward a little bit to what we know is your baby, the Velvet Rope. Um, I just kind of wanted to bring you back there for just a second and and sort of say uh, or ask you, I guess, when it came to the Velvet Rope and you heard that album in its entirety for the for the first time, uh, can you remember what your thoughts were? Like, were you just so ready to attack this thing? Oh, yeah. Um, I was completely ready to attack it. I mean, when again, it's, it's, you don't always get to work on the music you want to, when you're a choreography, you work on the music that's given to you. So when the 
to blend. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, like I have so many ideas. I, and the funny thing is I did have so many ideas and I had so many thoughts. I had so many feelings and I wanted to work on it, but I also have a very limited amount of energy, both mentally and physically. So for me, it's like, I can't, I'm not going to listen to a song until it's time for me to work on it. Okay. Because then I'll get bored and then I have no creativity. Renee was the complete opposite. He would listen to everything a thousand hundred million times. So there was one point, you know, Janet would invite um, me over. We would work out. We would talk about the show. We would talk about ideas and just kind of throw things out while we're working out and being silly and giggling. And every time I'd go to her house, Renee's got the music blasting. And finally, one day she called me over and I was like, you know what, Jay, I don't, I don't know how to say this because I don't want to offend anybody, but I cannot listen to this every day. It's making me crazy and I'm going to get sick of all this amazing music because Renee won't shut off the record. Like he would come in every time in our workout. Hey, listen to this. Hey, listen to this. Cause he's so excited. And we were all really excited because the music was just, uh, it was just off the charts. It was, it was invigorating. And it was, so that was my biggest challenge was, okay, how do I hang out with Jan, talk about the show, be creative and not want to listen to any of this music ever <laughs> until I'm ready to work on it. You know, I have to take one piece and that's just me. I have to take one piece at a time, one concept at a time. And we can talk about the whole thing in its, in as a whole, but when it comes down to it, I need to be very specific. Like this is, this is what we're working on. So on one hand, I was chomping at the bit and yet be, trying to be very selective. And like, it literally, I was like foam coming out of my mouth and then just kind of hang in there. Like, <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. I'm not ready. I don't know what we're doing. Stop playing the music. Please just stop. <laughs> so, it was needless to say, it was a very, very exciting time. I was very aware of how lucky I was to have, you know what it was also it was like, because so many songs were so amazing, you're like, what's going to get released? What's going to be first? What's going to be second? How do we plan this out? And, you know, obviously it, it took its course, but those are all the things that are, and I left all that up to Janet. I had no say in what song came out first or what I thought. I'd give my opinion, but at the end of the day, it's like, she's the expert. The record company's involved. Let them do that. You just tell me what I'm working on and I'm ready. Okay, cool. I have to ask you this, and I, I feel like this might be a challenging question for you, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, uh, because you and Janet were so close and you were working in the same bubble for so many years, I'm certain that it's it's not easy to see the big picture. But did you ever have a moment kind of pop into your head where you were like, uh, wow, this is Janet, my good friend, but she's also this amazingly talented artist, someone who is definitely going down in history. Like, did you ever have, because I know what it's like to kind of be in it every day. You're, like you said, you're going to your, your job, you're going to your work, but did it ever kind of pop to you going like, wow, she she is legendary? <laughs> it is a hard question because when you're f truly friends with someone, at least for me, I see you first as my friend. I will always see you first as my friend. Um, so I didn't have a lot of that and I don't want to make it sound like I didn't uh, appreciate or respect where she was in life. She was Jan. She was my friend. She was an artist. She was a lot of things, but because I knew her differently. And I think also because I knew her from the beginning of her career, even though I know she had the, the albums before I didn't know her then, but like it, she kind of exploded into our friendship developed. I think it was more or less when things, when she'd be presented with awards and you're sitting back and you're watching the collage that somebody puts together for her, you know, like the award show would put together for her or she would turn in or whatever. And you're watching and you watch all the, and you're like, Oh, I forgot about that. Oh. And then it, and then it slowly starts to go, wow, my friend's pretty amazing. Like, She's even more amazing than I thought I thought she was, you know? So it's kind of like a, a um, afterthought in a sense, but, um, and because she was always surrounded with fan, fan you, you kind of get used to that from somebody. I would find myself more on the bodyguard side, like wanting to protect her from overexposure or, or just like, she, can she just eat in peace? Can you guys just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll help you get these things signed, but just give her a second. Like I don't, I was, I've always felt like I was a, a buffer for, for her trying to have some normal normalcy in her life. 
Um, I don't think I was very good at it. But so for me, it was a, just a different position, I guess. But I not once did I ever doubt her brilliance or her talent or or any of that. I just think that was a given. This is my friend. This is how amazing she is. Boom. They both go together. And it was a it was an entire package for me. I'm going to fast forward you now to some time when you weren't working with her, but when everything kind of um, really exploded in a bad way uh, for a while, which was the Super Bowl fiasco, as Mm -hmm. I like to call it. Um, And then it was months and years after that it just seemed to follow her around, which was, I think, for her true fans, just super annoying because it's like she's so much more than this. Like, get over it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, Right. But now it's come to light. And I'm not sure if you've uh, been up to speed with this or not, but. There's been allegations recently in the last months or, you know, several months that uh, CBS's former chief, Les Moonves, potentially uh, was going after her to to really disrupt, you know, disrupt her career. We don't we have no proof of this yet, but it's there's enough people saying it that there may be some grain of truth in this. Um, What are Mm. your thoughts on how uh, not necessarily on on him, but just on. The Super Bowl, and and, and again, uh, I know you weren't choreographing for her at the time, but like watching her have to go through that. Yeah, that was weird. It was tough. It was, um, y- you know, I um, I can't speak too much on it because I, I don't feel comfortable only because I wasn't there at the time. So I can't say what their feelings were, what their thoughts were. So mine is just from a spectator being on the outside, but also understanding how some things happen on the inside. So for me, I thought it was, it was very unfortunate. Um, that some decisions were made that produced what produced. Um, and, and, and I, I know there's, you know, the fans, I, I get it. Like everyone was, you, you kind of have to pick a side. Was it the smart thing to do? Was it an accident? Was it not, you know, get over it. Justin, they gave it to Justin, you know, it, it, there's so many sides to this, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, I think, and this is this is what a lot of people forget is that you have to know your audience and American football is its own thing. I mean, I'm now living in the South and I really get it. I'm like, oh, this is really different than Hollywood. It's different than the mindset here is very different. And you don't know that when you're living in the Hollywood bubble and the entertainment bubble. Um that people hold their football and their football celebrations very, very sacred. So um, on one hand, it was, it's frustrating because, you know, as an artist, you're, 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 you want to challenge things. You want to take chances. You want to be exciting. You want to, you know, shock people. Um, And I think to me, the, the, the only thing that I could say was the mistake was it was the wrong platform for whatever they wanted to achieve after the fact. um, Yeah. I mean, I don't know this man from CBS. I'm sure that he was vengeful, you know, maybe uh, upset, whatever the case. I, I, and I haven't heard any about these allegations, you know, I live in my backyard in the dirt. (laughs) Yeah. Which I love. So uh, I'm sure if if that is true, if he is going after her or was going after her, I don't know what happened to him on after that performance. I don't know what happened to his career because of the result of that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he's right by any means. I'm not saying anyone who goes after anyone for pure vengeance. I mean, I believe in karma, so everyone's going to get their own eventually. But I, I, I do think it went on quite long for her. I I didn't expect people to bounce back from that quickly, but I also didn't expect it to, to linger quite as long as it did. So yeah, that was, uh, uh, sorry. I just have so many thoughts, but they're just opinions and I, I don't want to put anything negative out there. I'm glad. And I feel strongly that that is all over with. Perfect. Yeah. Agreed. And, and I did want to ask you this now, Janet was eligible to go into the rock and roll hall of fame as of 2007. It took a while for her to even get, you know, the first nomination. First of all, it should have only been one. She should have been in immediately as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure a lot of the fans feel that way too. Um, do you, but like, and if I could just sort of say Madonna, like she was, I think, eligible around the same time, 2007, it was in the next year. And it just seemed like a grave injustice that Janet wasn't, you know, thought in the same class as well, or, or thought that she should be uh, by the people that weren't you know, right. doing the 
<clears throat> nomination committee. Um, did you do you think it took too long for her to get in? Um, when was the Super Bowl thing? Two thousand and four. Okay, so yes, of course, I think it was. It took too long. But looking at that situation and the way people in our industry are, nobody wants to be the first. No one wants to take a chance, right? So they they kind of all live really safe. Like, uh, I don't know, is, is, is she still connected with that? You know, is that still following her? Is that cloud still following her? Do we want to be a part of that? Everyone gets really nervous and weird. So it doesn't surprise me that Madonna got in first. Did I think she should have? No, but she did. And, and it is what it is. And I mean, here we are in 2019 and if she's, since 2007, I'm like, yeah, that's a little bit too long. But at the same time, I think she's in a much better place now um, as far as her performance, her career. I, and I'm, I'm speaking from a spectator, not from like I have no inside knowledge. I'm just looking like I think people have put that the Super Bowl thing to bed. I think the drama surrounding it like the, it is is dissipated. I think it's a it's a a cleaner slate for her to receive this award for her to actually be inducted so that there's no baggage attached to it. So even though it took a long time, I think had it happened sooner, she should, still would have had that baggage attached to it um, by no means, you know, of her own, but just that it would have been there. And I think with the time now that there is a blessing in it that yes, it took a long time, but she's there now and it's with a clean slate. If Janet were on the call with us right now, what message would you give to her? I know you guys are <laughs> friends, but like if she was hanging out with us on on mute right now, what would you uh, what would you say to her about getting this induction, this huge honor? Um, well, I would say what I texted to her. I said, "Congratulations, and it's about time." Awesome, very good. Uh, I love you profusely. Before I let you go, though, I did want you to tell us what is up next for Tina Landon. Oh goodness. Um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I always start the new year going, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. More of the same, more acting. I am super um, loving it right now. I'm just in a, a better place with, with acting that I love the creativity side of it. I feel like I'm there with acting where I was with choreography, and I still am. And I've been doing a lot more teaching and conventions and speaking, and I'm, I'm reaching out just to new kind of, I, I just love the raw energy of kids. And I just got done working with Paula Abdul on her tour. And that was amazing and a great way to reconnect and go, oh my God, this is kind of how I started out with Paula. Then we choreographed things together. Now I'm choreographing for Paula. It kind of came full circle. So I'm hoping that some other things will come full circle in 2019. We will see. Um, but until then, I'm, I have an open mind and open heart, and I'm ready for God's blessings. Perfect. And last thing before I let you go, first of all, uh, just a happy birthday to you from all the fans. We love you so much. So many of them have, have reached out and, uh, you know, because I put a little uh, Facebook post up about how much I love you and, and how, you know, happy birthday. So people sent messages to me saying, oh, my God, if you speak to her, wish her happy birthday. So I'm sending all the love from all the Janet fans Aww. and all the Tina thank fans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who love you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. And uh, I have to just bring this up before you do. I know your husband surprised you taking you to a Justin Timberlake concert. Uh you know, for your birthday. And I know they threw in a little Janet. Can you just explain to the fans what happened? Because I think it's an amazing story. Um, well, it was, first of all, the whole night was a complete shock to me. I didn't know where we were going. My husband kidnapped me with a couple of my friends. We ended up at a concert. It was Marty Kodalka came out. I'm like, oh my God, we're here to see Justin. What's happening? How did I get here? And then next thing I know, you know, you're just enjoying the concert. You're going, this is awesome. And then it's kind of a double take. You're like, wait, that looks like Oh my God, they just did it on stage. What? What? What's happening? So, I mean, there's, there's just no bigger honor than that. I was, I really have no words. It was just, I, I was very humbled by it. It was, it was one of the coolest things ever. Awesome. Well, I thought did... my husband was going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a sweetie. I love that. And uh, that was just so awesome because I, I saw a little bit of video footage, I think, that you posted of it. So uh, to the fans that are listening right now, make sure you go and check out um, uh, Tina's Facebook page and, and, and all that stuff because it's fantastic just to see them do a little uh, uh, honor as they should to, to Tina Lennon. So, Tina, I love you so much. Thank you so much for doing this and for always you know, being such a supporter of, of Janet and all the work that you've done with her. 
Thank you. I love you, too. That is award-winning choreographer Tina Landon. Make sure you follow her on Twitter and Instagram at I am Tina Landon. Hey, it's Kelly. Thank you so much for hanging out and watching and listening to our interviews. We always appreciate your time. Please make sure to follow us on our YouTube channel and also hit up our website so that you can subscribe to our newsletter so you are always up to date with everything that we have got going on with the show. KellyAlexanderShow.com slash subscribe.